very warm welcome to our service. As has been the case for a number of weeks now, we're posting our services to YouTube whilst the coronavirus restrictions continue. Today's service is the fourth in our series of Psalms 120 to 134, the Psalms known as the Songs of Ascents. We've now reached Psalm 123. I hope that you will enjoy the service and that it will be a blessing to you during these challenging times for everyone. We put our hope in the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. Your unfailing love surrounds us, Lord. Our hope is in you alone. A hymn today which reflects the theme of today's servant on Psalm 123 is Master Speak, thy servant heareth. Let's pray. Lord of creation, your glory is all around and within us. Help us to open our eyes to your wonders so that we can serve you with reverence and know your peace in our lives through the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for your transforming power and your gift of love in Jesus. Speak to us and fill your church with the power of your spirit. Help us to see beyond the confines of our own desires. Equip us to live lives of faith in this changing world. Give us a desire for justice and mercy and enrich our lives 
so that wherever we are, we will delight in you. Wherever you call us to be your people, help us to recognise the possibilities of your kingdom, to tread boldly as we carry the gospel and love others as you, as you have commanded. Forgive us when we go our own way and forget to put you first. Help us to put you at the centre of all we do so that we will glorify you in our lives. Lord, as we come to your word this morning, we ask that we will be open to hear all that you want to say to us and help us to respond to your word and teaching so that we will become more like you. And bless us as we say together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. Today we come to the sixth letter of the alphabet, and it is F. So a couple of words came to my mind when I thought about F. Fabulous, faithful, and forgiving. And we're going to think for a few moments about forgiving. God is a forgiving God. In your house or at school, when you do something wrong, are you asked to say sorry to the person you hurt? And when someone does something to you, do you forgive them? We've all done wrong things. We might have lost our temper or taken a toy from our brother or sister when we know we shouldn't have. Or we haven't done something our parents or our teachers have asked us to. And then we might be tempted to lie about it and say we had done it. Or have you ever broken something in the house and when you're asked, did you do that? You say, no, not me. So we've all sinned and we need to be forgiven by other people and by God. When we do things that hurt other people, we are also hurting God. And we should say sorry to God for the things we have done wrong. Sometimes, even if we say sorry to someone else, they might not forgive us. But God will always forgive us, for he is a forgiving God. We read in Micah, There is no other God like you, O Lord. You forgive the sins of your people. You do not stay angry forever but you take pleasure in showing us your constant love. You will be merciful to us once again. You will trample our sins underfoot and send them to the bottom of the sea. You will show your faithfulness and constant love to your people. God is a forgiving God. Now there are always consequences of sin, of doing something wrong. When you admit you have done something wrong at home or at school, you might get punished in some way. You might get sent to your room or not be allowed outside to play with your friends. So it is with God. There has to be a punishment. But the really good news is that we do not have to do the punishment for God. Someone else has already taken our punishment. God's son, Jesus, died on the cross that we might be forgiven by God for all the wrong things we have done. Isn't that a marvellous thing? We don't deserve this, but God freely gives us this forgiveness and Jesus willingly died on the cross that we could be forgiven. The book of Acts tells us, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Through him, everyone who believes is set free from sin. To know that we have this forgiveness from our sins, we need to believe that Jesus died for us. And we can say sorry to God for all that we do that is wrong. And we do this through prayer. Remember we spoke about prayer before? Prayer is talking to God. 
so we can talk to God and tell him every day when we have done something wrong. When we've lost our temper or fallen out with our friends or not done something we should have. We can talk to God about it. And we're also asked to forgive other people when they do something wrong to us. And that is what the line in the Lord's Prayer that we've just said means. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. So when someone hurts us or does something wrong to us, we are to forgive them, even if they don't come and say sorry to us. We forgive them because God has forgiven us. So the letter F stands for forgiving. Let's just say a short prayer together. Heavenly and loving Father, we thank you that you have forgiven us for all the wrong things that we do every day. Help us to remember this. Help us to come to you each day and to say sorry for the things that we do that are not good. In Jesus' name, Amen. Thank you. Our reading today is from Psalm 123, verses 1 to 4. This is God's word for us. To you I lift up my eyes, O you who are enthroned in the heavens. Behold, as the eyes of the servants look to the hand of their master, as the eyes of a maidservant to the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look to the Lord our God, till he has mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, O Lord, have mercy upon us. For we have had more than enough of contempt. Our soul has had more than enough of the scorn of those who are at ease, of the contempt of the proud. Amen. Our current series is looking at Psalms 120 to 134, the Psalms known as the Songs of Ascent. It's usually thought that these 15 psalms divide naturally into five groups of three. That's certainly what the respected Old Testament scholar Alex Motia thought. But there do seem to be other linkages, a view taken by none other than Charles Spurgeon, the 19th century Prince of Preachers, as he was known. Spurgeon thought that Psalm 123, to which we turn today, could be thematically linked to Psalms 120 to 122, even though they were almost certainly not written by the same person. And I think Spurgeon was right. Psalm 123 will immediately resonate with countless numbers of despised and rejected people the world over. Those who face all kinds of prejudice and discrimination, the oppressed dissidents and intolerant dictatorships, those whose life chances are blighted by poverty and lack of education, the shunned and ignored, the unwelcome strangers in a foreign land the bullied or oppressed, those whose beliefs are ridiculed or suppressed because they just don't fit with the prevailing culture. It was always thus. More than two and a half thousand years after the psalm was written, our broken world still experiences widespread prejudice, discrimination, and hatreds. Here in Psalm 123, the psalmist, on behalf of his community, pleads to God for mercy, not once but twice, because they've suffered, indeed had their fill of, scorn and contempt. The scorn and contempt of the proud, who, as the psalmist puts it, are at ease with themselves we might say, rather full of themselves. You know, other things may hurt and bruise, but there's something about scorn and contempt which chills to the bone. They go deep into the soul. 
perhaps deeper than any other forms of rejection, the humiliating, the degrading, and the psalmist community have had enough. They can take no more. Like many before and since who need to hit the very bottom before turning for help, that's where the psalmist and his community found themselves. At the very bottom, at the end of their tether, with nowhere else to turn. So what is it that links Psalm 123 to the three psalms which precede it? Well, in Psalm 120, we find the psalmist in despair. He's hit the bottom and he cries out for help. Then, in Psalm 121, the psalmist looks up from his despair for signs of God's grace. He lifts his eyes to the hills which the Lord has made. Mountains and hills are symbols of God's majesty. It was on Sinai's height that Moses received the law. It was on Mount Carmel that Elijah confounded the priests of Baal. It was on Mount Hermon that Jesus was transfigured. And it was on Mount Zion that the Jews established their holy city. Mountains and hills reflect God's wonderful creation and sovereignty. But in Psalm 122, the psalmist goes further. For here, he goes to the temple in Jerusalem, to God's very house, to pray for peace and prosperity for all peoples. The temple was a glorious sight, the Holy of Holies. Devout Jews made every effort to make a pilgrimage there at least once a year, to offer sacrifices and to sing praises to the Lord their God. The temple was a glorious sight. People of faith often have their sacred places. Our Roman Catholic brethren have St Peter's in Rome. Hindus have the Ganges, their sacred river. Muslims have Mecca. And to all of those places, millions make pilgrimage. Where, though, are the Reformed faith's sacred places? We'll find, though, many of our church buildings are. We don't have any, do we? And that's what brings us to Psalm 123. For more than the downcast cry for help in Psalm 120, more than looking up to the hills in Psalm 121, more than journeying into God's house in Psalm 122, here in Psalm 123, the psalmist lifts his eyes to where? To God himself in the heavens. To you I lift up my eyes, O you who are enthroned in the heavens, he says. Why? Because that's where he knew God's mercy was to be found. He puts it like this. As the eyes of servants look to the hand of their master, as the eyes of a maid servant to the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look to the Lord our God till he has mercy upon us. Much has been said and written in recent weeks about slavery, about its effects on black lives, and about statues to those who historically promoted or benefited from slavery. Well, you'll all be relieved to know that I have no intention of adding to that particular controversy. But in the days when the psalmist was writing, probably around 600 BC, slavery was common. And a slave would become so devoted and obedient to their master as to be alert to even the slightest inflection of their eyebrow or the tiniest movement of their finger, completely attuned to their master's desires and ready at all times to serve him. It's a graphic and instructive simile, for it poses the question, what does it mean today 
to be completely attuned to our master's desires and to be ready at all times to serve him. It means being attuned to his teachings and example about prayer, mercy, greed, judgment and a whole lot more besides. And so we need again and again to attune ourselves to the Gospels, to read, reflect, absorb and act on what we read there. Like the prophet Samuel, we too must ask, speak Lord, your servant is listening. For supremely, the Lord speak to us through his word. But it also means knowledge. The knowledge of every Christian man and woman that above and beyond all else our Master died for us. That we might be rescued from our sins, yes. But also that we might be free then to live to his glory. Our Lord Jesus Christ presents himself to us as both servant and master. A suffering servant who knew what it was to be despised and rejected by scornful and contemptuous men. And also a master, but a very different kind of master. One to whom we are not enslaved. The freedoms the world restlessly seeks, its self-serving demands, its incessant desires, its lofty ambitions, are but a mirage of freedom. Our master offers real freedom, not servitude. The freedom which comes from choosing to serve him, and which then leads, as night follows day, to service to others. Today, our reformed faith has no holy places. We look not to a place, but to a person, to the one who is holy, the one who has made himself known to us in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who died for us, that we might live to his glory. Psalm 123 is a psalm about distress. It's about people at the end of their tether, Luther called it the deep sigh of a pained heart. But Psalm 123 is also a psalm about trust and hope and confidence, about where to look when the storms of life rage all around us and threaten to engulf us. Distress is the catalyst to a life of faith when it causes us, in our despair, to let go of self, lift our eyes to the heavens, and call upon the name of the one whose power is infinitely greater than ours. It's just a matter of where we look. No better. It's just a matter of to whom we look. This old hymn writer knew what she was talking about. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. Then the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you that all things were created through you and for you. You are before all things and in you all things exist. We pray that as we continue to bring our gifts to you, that you will accept them and use them to your glory. We pray for everyone working in the NHS who have been working so hard under such difficult circumstances for such a long time now. We pray for each of them that you will give them everything they need to keep going for as long as they have to. We thank you for the positive signs that the virus is being defeated through their hard work and the hard work of all the scientists and advisors who have been guiding our national leaders. Continue to give them the wisdom they need and help each one of us continue to observe the rules that are still in place 
so that we can get back to normal life as soon as possible. We thank you, Lord, that although all the usual holiday clubs have been cancelled, that so many have gone online. We pray for each one and ask that they will be fun and effective ways of sharing the good news of Jesus with so many children. We pray especially for our online holiday club in late July and ask that as we plan and prepare, you will give us all the ideas we need and all the technical aspects will run smoothly. We pray for each person who will be involved as they prepare their parts, that you will help them to know what to say and speak through them. We pray for our minister, Gordon, in his study leave. May it be a productive time for him and we pray that he will accomplish all that he wants to in this time. We pray for Andy and Jill as they take over the role of session clerk and deputy session clerk. Bless them both in this busy and responsible job and guide them as they serve you. Thank you for the many years that this job was done by Alistair and for his faithfulness and wisdom in helping to lead the church into such a difficult time. And Lord, we thank you for your word to us this morning and that you have spoken to each one of us. Help us to respond to you and to live our lives in love to you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. That brings us to the end of our service. Thank you for listening. Next week, we continue our look at the Songs of Ascent, this time with Psalm 124. A blessing as we finish. May the blessing of our one God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with us all today, in the challenging weeks ahead of us and always. Amen.